it'll reflect. Hopefully our numbers are, you know, have gone up quite a bit and we'll see where we're at. So this is kind of in general what the sense can look like, a lot like 2010 as far as questions go. Uh, I know there's been a lot of stuff in the, in the media outlets and whatnot, but essentially the, uh, the questionnaire is going to look the same as it did in 2010. Uh, the new thing for 2020 is that it'll be done online. You can do it online if you want. Um, they haven't really put a whole lot of information out about that because they just, you know, they're, they're still working on, I think, a lot of the process on how it's going to work. Um, but we'll know more in January or so. So mid-March, late March is when residents are going to kind of start seeing the invitation to fill out the questionnaire online. Um, and then just basically in a nutshell, if you don't, you're going to get up to four subsequent reminders via mail before they start knocking on your door um, to fill it out. I don't have a whole lot about this one, just so in case anybody asks you, yes, it's confidential. So, and it's not just a small fine, 250K and five years in prison, we're up to, I guess. Uh, locally, uh, which is kind of what I really wanted to focus on tonight, was what we've been doing locally to try to get a complete count, and that's what we want. We don't want anybody to not be counted. That's tax dollars, that's grant dollars, that's, that's money for the city um, and for the, and the region and for the state. Um, as in the past, they've, we formed a complete count committee, lots of public and private sector people involved, University of Northern Iowa, school districts, Intercog has kind of taken the lead on this. Um, the only difference this year is the funding has pretty much gone away from the federal government. There's no longer any grants for us to do things like marketing, outreach, material printing. Um, so thankfully, uh, UNI professor uh, got invited to the meeting and she gave the assignment to her UNI practicum class the task of getting us a website getting us a domain, um, taking the information from the census on putting together marketing materials, localizing it, um, translating it to different languages, and then of course getting a social media presence up. Um, as we know uh, from research, you know, different demographics, different ages, different cultures, they all, you know, yeah, marketing to them each individually is not going to, you have to, you have to tailor it to each one of those. Uh, there's going to be three areas that we're going to primarily focus on. Uh, these have been historically undercounted uh, populations in previous censuses. Um, college students, obviously for Cedar Falls it's a big deal. If they live here most of the year, which I guess if you go to class both semesters, you should live here about eight months out of the year, we want them counted for Cedar Falls. Um, children under five, they've done a lot of research. They don't know why, they just do know that um, in the last census, about one in 10 were not counted for whatever reason. Um, and I've got some numbers up there just so you guys have an idea of what we're looking at for Cedar Falls. And then of course, low income and rental households. Um, that's just information that we're gonna wanna put together and provide you and I uh, so that they can put that into their research and marketing. And they're gonna be working on this pretty much the entire semester, but with the idea that if we can get some funding from some uh, community foundations, uh, we'd like to be able to have their work transferred over to some sort of marketing firm, uh, much like they did in 2010, who can pick up the project and kind of be that filler for the rest of the, the process through the census. Uh, keep the materials current, you know, put any updates out, that kind of stuff. So next steps for us, Obviously, we want to build a page on Sear Falls' website to kind of be a pointer, um, provide these materials, um, you know, kind of a place for catch-all information. We'd like to obviously be able to put uh, census materials at the city offices. Uh, in the past, we've done schools, churches, kind of anybody that was willing to, you know, put any information out there. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, you got to know that it's coming. It's important, and we want to get everybody counted. Um, I just have a couple of stats up there. The 21,000 number is all over. There's a lot of research being done lately. Um, you know, there's fear of this undercount thing, and I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of perspective on that. So, you know, $21,000 for each person we miss over 10 years. 
So in Cedar Falls, our most current estimate is just over 41,000. So it's really not unreasonable to think that we could miss 400 people in Cedar Falls. Um, so just some kind of food for thought, but um, that's all I've got for you tonight. Any questions? Thanks, Corey. Anything for Corey from Council? Thanks. Appreciate Excellent. it. All right. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Creekside Technology Center Master Plan. I think uh, Shane Graham will come up and kick things off. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in 2010 and in 2015, uh, City Council authorized the purchase of about 157 acres of uh, farm ground located at uh, the, near the intersection of Hudson Road and West Ridgeway Avenue along the south side there. It's kind of bordered by Highway 20 uh, on the south and Ridgeway Avenue on the east or on the north. Uh, purpose of that land acquisition was for future development. Uh, we've been leasing it out as farm ground since we've acquired it. Um, late last year, um, city decided to um, look at hiring a consultant to do a master plan, uh, see what kind of uses uh, might be um, in the market for that property. Uh, so we hired uh, Confluence out of Cedar Rapids and Des Moines. Uh, they submitted an RFP for, for the master planning services. Uh, as part of that master planning service, they're also looking at a market analysis, which will help guide uh, the uh, uses of the property. Uh, they're also provided a brochure, a marketing brochure that we can use uh, to market the property. Uh, and then also included a, a, a video uh, that we can also share for marketing purposes. So as part of the scope of services, uh, they gave a presentation to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, they did that in September. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission then came back and recommended approval of the plan. And now we're at the step of uh, presenting the uh, master plan to the uh, council today uh, with the goal of bringing it back at a, at a, a coming meeting for formal adoption. So uh, with the uh, team tonight, with Confluence is Chris Shires and Brenda Nelson, and with Howard R. Green, who did uh, the civil uh, engineering work on this, is Aaron Granquist. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and they're going to give you a presentation. And um, I do have copies of the plan that in paper form that I'm running right now. So by the end of the meeting, I'll hopefully have them to you. So Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Mayor and Council, it's our pleasure to be uh, with you tonight. Uh, again, I'm Chris Shires, and we have Brenda Nelson here, and of course, Aaron Granquist uh, sitting down there. So uh, try to ask a really tough question so he has to get, get out his chair and come up here. Something tough engineering-wise. So we have a, um, I'll just uh, switch to show our agenda here. Oh, maybe I should start the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> Uh, on the agenda, we have a lot to run through. We're going to start through uh, kind of the basis of the analysis, our study, uh, the site analysis, the key elements and components we came up with, as well as the master plan. In the master plan, we're going to play that video that Shane talked about. Then we're going to run through the special design guidelines that we developed uh, for this uh, property. Uh, please feel free to interrupt us. Uh, as we're going through the presentation, it falls along the, the uh, master plan report. Uh, we're going to go quickly, but stop us if there's something you want us to go into more greater detail on. And so with that, um, as I'll, I'll cut through this kind of quick. So obviously, we were just hired last year to, to complete this. You guys know this is a very important uh, gateway into the community. Uh, and, and we were tasked with uh, finding the highest and best use of the property. You know, what's its best use ultimately for the community? Uh, and then to continue that, that success you've had uh, in your nearby business parks. Uh, just so we're all on the same page, uh, on this map, north is up. Uh, so you got US 20 to the south, and so then our intersecting street at Hudson. So we're on either side of that, all south of Ridgeway and the property that the city has purchased. Uh, so we had four main guiding principles we developed uh, as we worked through this. Uh, this was intended to kind of control and manage uh, this very important uh, uh, gateway into the community. Uh, we wanted to develop a high-end uh, tech center, office park, or industrial park. And what are those other kind of complementary uses that would be best uh, for this property? Uh, third, we wanted to utilize as much of that existing natural terrain, especially on that western parcel. Uh, as well as making stormwater, uh, uh, meeting the stormwater requirements an amenity for the property uh, versus a detraction. And then finally, I want to make sure we're providing good internal and external connections for walkers, uh, bikers, uh, even our motoring public. 
And so with that, Brenda is going to run through a little bit on our site analysis. So one of the first things we do in pretty much every project is take a look at the existing conditions of the site and identify you know, what's there, what are factors that are going to be important in our design. And as you can see here, um, Chris already talked about, we've got that floodway and the natural creek on the west side. Uh, this project is really important because of the exposure that it has, both from Highway 20 and Ridgeway and Hudson. I mean, it's just a really key intersection. And so you have views into the site. It's kind of, um, as you come from Highway 20, you're up above the site and you can kind of see down into it and you can split right through it. If you're on Hudson Road and of course you're going by it on Ridgeway Avenue and you have views from those directions. Also, we might noted that there is some highway noise coming from Highway 20 and so we wanted to address that as well as the fact that of course it's the gateway um, to kind of you and I and Cedar Falls in some ways, one of the major gateways and so we wanted to capitalize on that for this project. Um, so moving on here. Then the next thing we did as part of this uh, really quick overview to assess the project is to look at what kind of opportunities we had here. And um, as you can see, we identified in the, in the yellow circle there, the gateway was important. We ident identified that we have some existing proposed intersections along Ridgeway, which we might want to meet up with. And we were able to um, take a look at meeting those as well as um, trying to find a circulation system that worked with uh, as a low impact design. So we're not doing a lot of grading, we're minimizing the grading and that sort of thing. And we're also um, working around the existing uh, soils that kind of run through the site uh, from east to west and underneath um, Hudson Road. There's some kind of drainage soils that go along in there. And so we said, well, with that in mind, there are some opportunities that we could possibly use for stormwater detention to not only detain water, but to create an amenity um, for the people. Not, not just the floodway area on the west side where we have some right, really nice natural features, but let's create something on the east side as well. So we um, did that and looking a little bit closer up, here is the west side. Again, we've identified what kind of the uses, uh, the zoning is around it. Um, you can see that the flood area, floodway, the 100 year and 500 year um, flood zone takes up quite a bit of the portion of the west site. We also identified that there were some trails that we wanted to connect to. There's a great trail system here in Cedar Falls and so uh, let's just take advantage of that and make sure that we're connected both internally and externally. Here's a close up of the east side. With that on both the east and west we also identified and realized that there was going to be future development to the east and west and we wanted to provide um, an access point or future connection to those. So that's what we did. Looking at utilities, existing utilities, we really are in pretty good shape in terms of the proximity of existing utilities. Um, most of them are present in a close proximity. Uh, you have water on Ridgeway and on Hudson Road. You, you have um, gas running along the east side of the site. There's a, an existing um, sanitary sewer stubbed kind of to the northwest corner of the east parcel. Um, so that will service, and particularly the east side is well equipped to have some development occur quickly with utilities in the area. And then there's fiber optic pretty much available in proximity on both sides, both east and, east and west. Um, so. So to run through a couple of the key uh, elements uh, through this plan, uh, the first one we want to touch on is the market analysis. So for this, we completed a, a full market study, market analysis for the project. What is its potential? And so some of the, the things we all know is it is a very highly visible and therefore valuable site. We only have so many interchange properties uh, in our community. Uh, it is near a lot of existing commercial and uh, business development. And so uh, our study does say that this is very favorable for that continued office, business park, um, kind of tech, light industrial type uh, development, as well as the potential as a corporate campus site. Uh, there's a little bit of market demand for some ancillary retail to support all that employment uh, in the area. Um, uh, you know, we could put a lot of single family houses and that might develop quickly, but that is not what would be the highest and best use for this property. Uh, it, it is much more uh, too far disconnected uh, from other areas of the community that that would not be reasonable or viable. Plus it's, again, US thir uh, 20 uh, frontage property, not the highest and best use. 
So based on what we consider the best uses, or highest and best uses, it is a 30 to 60 year build out estimate. Uh, and that is a conservative estimate. But we want to share that with you, that if you don't see the properties develop fully immediately, uh, that, that's okay, that's to be anticipated. But uh, as communities, cities in particular, we have a long-term view on property, long-term view on development. We would encourage you to stay the course, be patient, do what you're supposed to do, and, and let this thing develop with uh, those highest and best uses. Uh, in essence, don't sell out for single family houses that would develop rel uh, relatively quickly. You only have so many interchanges, so hold out for this. We also don't know and can't predict when you get those once in a lifetime opportunities. You could have a single uh, corporate campus show up uh, and use up a significant amount of the property. Uh, this is really important uh, for the city to have this in your portfolio, this available land in your portfolio as you're uh, competing with other communities, not only in the state, not only in the region, but nationally uh, for key, key properties uh, for future employers. Um, in our analysis in that market, uh, in the master plan, is both a summary as well as a full market analysis that you guys can look over in great uh, detail. It did some uh, regional and then breaking it out to what our local capture is on a 10 year basis, which we did projections based on uh, in uh, different industrial categories. So you can spend some time kind of going through that uh, at your leisure. A few other key elements that I just wanted to mention real briefly, I won't go into great detail about these either, is um, we, we mentioned before we wanted this to be as low impact as possible. We wanted a simple design circulation for the vehicles coming through the site, which we did, which allows access to many of the, the lots that are available there. Um, we wanted to provide a very pedestrian oriented kind of uh, development, so you will see that there we have walks and we have this sort of central median that runs down the uh, boulevard that runs down the center center um, roadway that gives that pedestrian feel, tends to slow down traffic a little bit. We have tree-lined streets, uh, again, to enhance that pedestrian experience, and lots of trails and loop trails so people can enjoy um, their noon hour with a walk in um, the development. Utilities, as we mentioned, are pretty reasonably located close by. Um, I think most of this I probably discussed very briefly. We have sanitary available, electrical gas, communication services, and that type of thing. So we're all set up in that regard, particularly on the east side. Stormwater strat strategy um, is pretty much a traditional approach. Uh, we are using detention basins, primarily dry detention basins, except for one on the east side. And the design is really based on the stormwater, the city stormwater requirements and SUDAS. This is uh, an example, in the, you can see this image here, is a precedent image of what we envision that public space on the east side being, uh, not only to provide detention, but to maybe have that be an experience as well, an educational experience some, where you can, where the space is really activated when it rains, where you can see the water, what happens to the water and how it's detained and learn a little bit about it and, and it also can double as a pedestrian space. So we'll have, we're proposing a stormwater plaza um, with educational signage and um, some green spaces and planting there along with the de detention basin. There's another image of something that it could look like. And then let me briefly kind of go through our master plan. This is just a simple plan showing the lots that we've laid out here, anywhere from four to about 11 acres. You can see the circulation, the right-of-ways are, are identified there, as well as where the stormwater det uh, detention basins are. I'm trying to give you this overview because in all the other images, you won't really see the lot lines and, and you may not be able to identify as easily where the detention basins are. Most of our detention is, um, except for the one larger detention in the east, is on the west side kind of flanking that floodway area. This is an overview of the master plan then, uh, showing some proposed buildings and how circulation works and the parking might work. You might note that um, in general, and in all cases, we have buildings pretty much up against the right-of-way line and the parking behind, and we're providing buffers between, um, say, 
of the exterior Highway 20 and other residential areas uh, between there and the parking lot. So we're trying to buffer those areas that might want to be buffered and, and then make pedestrian spaces friendly along the right-of-way line. I'm going to go a little bit closer in then, starting with the east side. You can see um, we ha are proposing, in general, two-story to three-story buildings, except for in the northwest corner where we are proposing some hotel and retail kind of uses because that's uh, an, an appropriate use for that corner. Um, the rest of the site we're proposing office buildings or some of the other uses that Chris will talk about later. Um, you can see some green roofs on the buildings because we, we'd like this to be a sustainable um, kind of project. You can also see that we have the stormwater detention basin as an amenity of public space with trails around it. And you'll see that trails are um, running through the site, through the parking, all kind of leading towards that stormwater detention basin and um, also walks along the, the right of way as well. As we give you this information that, that Shane is printing off, you'll be able to kind of study a little bit each uh, office building, the capacity of it and how many stories there are. There is a culvert that runs under um, Hudson Road, and so the stormwater will outlet um, and then eventually go to Dray Run. As identified there in, in P, item P, those are the native landscape screening that you might find between the parking lot and the roadways. Here's a 3D image of what that might look like then. We're looking from the intersection of Hudson Road and um, Ridgeway. Now the west side, and also the other thing I should mention is up there we're in the corner of Hudson and Ridgeway where our item R is, is um, the gateway elements that we'll talk about in a little bit. But again the west side is predominantly, <laughs> that's a big, a large area of, of um, natural space and we are capitalizing on that with trails a couple of low water crossings across the creek, and um, this would just be a, a really great feature for this side, and really for the city, for this area. It could draw people in. And then here is our 3D image of, of the west side. So here we're looking at it a little bit more closer. We're a little closer to Highway 20, kind of looking back towards Ridgeway and to the northwest. Here's a street view of the east side. Um, so this is the boulevard that I'm talking about. That's some kind of central median running down the roadway corridor. And you can see we have walks and street landscaping and um, some street trees to really kind of create a very nice pedestrian corridor. This is an image of uh, looking northward of the gateway, and we are proposing signage that is much like what you see on University Avenue, so we've already got a great um, kind of branding going on with the city. We are just repeating that here with a couple of uh, larger monument signs, and they are at a 45 degree angle at the intersection, so they can be seen from both directions. Um, they're um, highlighted with some other um, pillar, uh, limestone pillars and landscaping to kind of reinforce that sense of entry so you really know you're arriving um, when you come up to it. Another um, image of that. That's just one of the sides. It's mirrored on both sides. Okay, do you want to run the, we're going to run a fly through now of yeah. the... Yeah, do you want to talk yeah, about we'll, we'll roll film. Yeah, roll I film. I think there's some lovely background music. Too. Yeah, that's right. Feel free to sing along. Yeah. <laughs> so we were glad you asked us to do this type of fly-through video because this is also an excellent marketing uh, tool that you can have on your website as well.
West parcel again is where we definitely could see a major corporate campus that, that could be marketed towards. Scene. Great. Okay, uh, unless you had any questions on that video, I'm going to run through the design guidelines we crafted specifically uh, for this property. Uh, so, uh, in order for us to achieve the vision of that master plan, uh, we do need some special regulations uh, for site design, uses, uh, layout, and maybe most importantly, uh, building design. Uh, we envision that these, this guidelines, these set of guidelines could be adopted as a supplement or a part of, say, uh, the Highway 20 uh, overlay district. Um, and this master plan that we've shown you, it is conceptual. Uh, it is not likely that the properties would be built completely or following exactly that master plan, uh, but what it is is a good gut check to make sure that we have a, a general idea of size and scale and density, and then from that we can build on uh, some of those regulations uh, that will be important to the community. Uh, and even those parcels we showed you were kind of a guess best of what we think uh, might be the best to market to, uh, but they're very flexible in that they can be smaller or join together and make into larger parcels. Uh, basically whatever an employer or a, a purchaser is looking at, uh, but again, it's a, the master plan is a good starting point. Uh, so we know uh, what we need from an infrastructure as well as zoning basis. Uh, so from the design guidelines, uh, there's a lot of different components. Uh, we do include uh, what we th feel as the intended land uses or those preferred land uses and specifically spell out those permitted uses. So corporate office, uh, medical office, uh, banks, uh, labs and testing facilities, research uh, facilities, uh, light manufacturing, uh, things without outdoor storage and not uh, heavy assembly. Uh, and, and no uh, semi-traffic, semi-truck traffic were very, very limited uh, to special delivery. Uh, but civic uses, educational, vocational, those would be also great uses. And then a limited amount of retail to support uh, th those employees and those employers, uh, such as, you know, restaurants and coffee shops and daycare, things like that. Uh, would also see that a hotel would be appropriate and uh, either a, a standalone or a, a part of a strip center uh, rec club or rec center. Certain uses we'd want to prohibit. Uh, we, would, we do not see that it's ideal, say, for single-family and multifamily residential. So single-family homes, apartments, not the best location. Of course, uh, not adult entertainment and a few other things uh, that we see less uh, advantageous to being here. Warehousing, heavy assembly, heavy, uh, uh, things with heavy truck traffic, major manufacturing. Um, from the uh, building setback and, and other design standpoints, we did uh, kind of in concert with your current zoning code, uh, put in some minimum two acre lot sizes, uh, some lot width standards, uh, reduce front yard setbacks because we're really trying to promote and support pushing the buildings out towards the street, putting the parking lots in the back, um, have some minimum building separations, and then a minimum building height uh, of 20 feet. So we always have the buildings of scale that you don't have some kind of flatter, squattier looking buildings that may not uh, represent the, the business park we think you um, envision. And then, and then a pretty healthy 30% open space requirement. Based on the topography, layout, and site, uh, site constraints, we think that's a very reasonable number, an appropriate number to, to leave these as good green sites as well. Parking, proposing that we're just following the city code's uh, current standards, uh, but that we do want to share parking when logical between off-peak uses. 
So a, rest, a restaurant use might be a heavier use during the evening versus an office use is a heavier use parking demand during, during the day hours. Um, so we have some statements in there about uh, anything that's not encumbered by a building or a parking lot needs to be well landscaped. Uh, we're promoting that we're using organic uh, mulch material in our landscape beds and around trees versus putting in chip brick or, or river rock, things like that. Uh, synthetics turf is also discouraged as we have been seeing kind of a movement on that on occasion. Uh, and then some really strong standards for uh, landscaping within the parking lot, uh, requiring uh, parking lot islands every so many stalls uh, on the end caps of rows of stalls, that there's uh, landscaping, uh, at least a tree in every island, uh, and that we're encouraging the use of green infrastructure, bioswells within the parking lot, um, curb drops uh, to, to take advantage of some natural drainage as well. Um, continuing on with that, uh, so in those cases where the parking lot uh, is visible or along a street, uh, we're wanting a minimum three foot, what we call a headlight screen to screen the front of those cars, kind of soften the impact of the parking lot combination of berming and landscaping, maybe low walls. And then we'll get into the real fun ones, some uh, building design standards. Uh, that first thing is that we're just following good architectural design principles, that buildings should have a top, a middle, and a base, depending on the architectural style. We're not promoting one architectural style. What we're promoting is uh, good, uh, good design with uh, use of good, solid materials, uh, materials that read as long-term and durable. Uh, and then uh, buildings do need to be in proportion, so buildings that are uh, three or more stories in height should have heavy material on the base, say a stone base or brick base within those lighter materials on top. And in a lot of cases, uh, we wouldn't see any type of a pitched roof on these uh, buildings because they tend to be out of scale on commercial industrial buildings, uh, especially when they're two or three stories tall. Uh, for the exterior materials, um, we're proposing that uh, we break things up into three categories of material types. We have primary materials. That's what we want to see the most of and along those primary facades. And those are those street visible or street fronting facades of the building, the face of the building. Uh, the secondary materials are ones that we're limiting to a little less on the primary facades and to the secondary facades, so those that are not uh, facing a public street. And then limited use materials. These are materials we'd want to see in a very limited application, say as a trim element. And then we have broken those out. And so in the, in the uh, design guideline recommendations, uh, we list those prim primary materials as uh, real brick. Uh, but it could be that thin set brick, as long as it's applied appropriately, that it still reads as if it's full depth uh, thick brick. Uh, the use of natural and synthetic stone and stone veneer the use of uh, glass, and then uh, burnished block, uh, architectural quality precast concrete panel, and then uh, composite metal wall panel material of that higher architectural grade, and then other things that are of that same class. Uh, secondary, um, again, more in inclined for those uh, secondary uh, wall faces, uh, split face concrete block, um, brick or stone that's been painted, uh, cast in place, concrete, and then uh, the, the lesser quality or the kind of the, the next level of those architectural metal panel, sometimes we consider those that have the, the fasteners uh, that are exposed. And then uh, uh, wood, uh, wood and cement fiberboard, such as e uh, hardy plank, real stucco, and then even EFIS. So what are those limited materials? That'd be smooth concrete block, um, translucent wall panels, ceramic glass, block, uh, vinyl, siding, uh, and then those other wood composite materials that are not quite that commercial grade. And then uh, standards on screening, now that we're talking about good building design, uh, that any of those mechanical units, uh, rooftop or ground mount um, mechanical units, uh, meters, uh, should be screened uh, from view, incorporated into the building design, uh, maybe the ones on the ground, it's a combination of walls and landscaping. Uh, for lighting, we are proposing uh, that this site be restricted to LED type uh, exterior light fixtures of a soft white or near white uh, color. Uh, that can really dress up a site. 
um, get away from our kind of sodium vapor metal halide lighting that has an orangey or blue color. Uh, but we want those good cutoff properties, downcast shoebox fixtures, uh, so we're not causing a lot of off-site glare. And then uh, signage, proposing we follow the city sign code standards as in place today. Any questions? I ran through a whole lot on building design guidelines, site design guidelines, one of my favorite topics. Do you have any questions before we go on to the next last section? It's just one. Um, looking in the design standards, uh, or the master plan west, I see the, the buildings uh, proposed or, or, or examples are all three-story buildings or very tall. Yes. Is that something that you would recommend, uh, like a minimum height? Yeah, great question. And so uh, our recommendation is that we're two to three stories in height. Uh, that's kind of the ideal sweet spot uh, for kind of getting that maximum value out of the land. Um, and it also has a better presence along this higher traffic area. And so if it is a one story, we had that 20 foot minimum height requirement, uh, but would be recommending two and three story. That was very, very purposeful uh, in our recommendation and design. Anything else from council? We're good. Okay, I'll have Brenda here wrap up with some of our phasing recommendations. Okay. Since this is a 30 to 60 year potential um, build out for this, uh, we, were, uh, develop, we developed a pretty strategic plan for how to accomplish that without um, having to do all of it at once. And so we have this divided into five phases, starting with the east side, the northwest or the west portion of the east side first, which is near the intersection of Hudson Road and Ridgeway, and uh, that makes sense because of the utilities, because of the um, exposure to the site, um, and so that's where we would start building that. Uh, we would build the detention stormwater plaza and uh, about the first half of that parcel. And then the second phase would be to build out that second half of the east parcel, but before we did that, we would have to provide a detention basin um, north of Ridgeway that would, as part of, uh, there's a small part of the area up to the north that would uh, need to drain to that direction, and so that would have to be accomplished first. And phase three, then we'd move to the west side. Prior to phase three happening, we would also expect that the signal, uh, there'd be a sig signalized intersection there at Hudson Road and uh, Ridgeway, and some improvements there, as well as improvements to the road itself um, going west. And after that occurred, then we could begin the phase three. Phase three uh, really has just those, um, we're, what we're proposing that those two buildings, some retail perhaps on the northeast corner of that, and would also include some um, development and restoration of the stream, <coughs> excuse me, and development of the trails in that open area so that people could, would not have to wait for the other phases to um, have some loop trails and low water crossings to get through there. So that would be phase three. Phase four is in the northwest corner. This is actually the shortest amount of roadway and the least amount of um, inf infrastructure investment. Uh, we would accomplish just that northwest corner with, with that. And then the final phase, which would probably be your greatest investment, would um, take you all the way from the southwest corner through and include that bridge over the creek. So that bridge it itself is a fairly significant investment. That would be the last phase. Any questions on that? During those phases, then, of course, we'd be also developing the stormwater detention basins that would correspond with the phase. I think we're good. Do you want to talk about the number of years out? Yeah. Oh, yeah, here so, we go. We're, we're, it's not up on the screen, but there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. It, or it, I can. It, just to be real uh, uh, clear, we wanted to give you a, a, a very uh, conservative, kind of honest approach on timing. And so we've outlined kind of some year estimates on the phase one through five. Uh, so again, you know, it's that 30, 50, 60 year kind of build out range. What is unknown is when you get those once in a lifetime projects, which happen. And then all of a sudden, that either greatly reduces the timeline, or you might even jump ahead and have a desire to begin uh, some work on, say, the West Parcel, uh, depending on what might happen. Uh, but we thought it fair. We need to kind of give you some thoughts on phasing and timing, and, and so that everybody's expectations are set straight. It's not going to build out overnight, 
but it's very valuable land. It's important for you to have this in your portfolio as you are competing for projects uh, as a region, as, a, as a, uh, this part of the region, uh, that you have land available that's gonna meet certain key things. And also this material we've developed, whether it's the master plan, the fly-through video, the marketing brochure, uh, are really important things to have out there on your website because site locators go to your website long before they ever call you. And so it's your first chance to make that first impression, to get on the list, uh, and then continue this growth that you've been seeing uh, in the, your community. So I think. Right, thank you very much. Anything further from council for Chris or Brenda? Mr. Whelan? Pessimistic and optimistic, and you've chosen a percentage for both the uh, office and industrial. How did you arrive at that percentage? So in that market analysis that our, our partner firm, Leland Consulting Group out of Portland, Oregon, put together for us, uh, they, they looked at 10-year projections. Uh, with those 10-year projections, um, they look at your, re your capture out of the region. So their analysis area was Black Hawk County, and then they do this analysis of what they think your capture percentage is. That is a real hard one to kind of calculate. So normally we kind of do a pessimistic and optim optimistic kind of range in there. Uh, we, we went a little bit on the high side. Uh, I still think it's a conservative approach, but a little bit of high side, because I think with your position in the region, your percent capture is going to probably accelerate over time. That'd be my, uh, my expectation based on my experience. And so we only gave you one per timeline projection to kind of keep it uh, consistent and similar. Um, and then a little bit why we kind of talk about a 30 to six year range. This, this isn't rocket science, it's not precise. <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's not even stormwater math. And so it's, it is a little bit of uh, what we think is gonna occur. And then there's a lot, a lot of changes that occur with the market. So we're really basing on past performance to try to predict the future. Okay, thank you very much. And it's, it's exciting to see the possibilities. Yeah. And I think you did an outstanding job, so thank you. You're welcome. Anything else from council? Well, again, Chris and Brenda, thank you very much. And Aaron, thanks for attending. <laughs> Are, sure we don't have a question for him? Well, we didn't have any questions for the engineer. That's why we're getting done a little bit sooner, probably. I don't know. Uh, finishing up here this evening for the committee of the whole is there a motion for bills and payroll? Okay. Motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. That concludes this evening's uh, committee of the whole. We will wait to the top of the hour, 7 o'clock, for the regular city council meeting. Thank you.